I write all my own scripts, you know. I come up with the ideas, film the b-roll, do the gameplay capture, record the benchmarks. I have complete control over my output on YouTube. I can do whatever I want. I only answer to my audience and what they want to see. Oh. Oh god. You people are sick, you know that? For those of you blissfully unaware, the NVIDIA GT710 is not a gaming GPU. You can tell that because it doesn't have an X in the name. Based on the now decade old Kepler 2 architecture, featuring 192 cores and a Wikipedia entry on the history of display outputs, Nvidia intends this GPU to be used simply as a display adapter, an inexpensive way for owners of basic PCs to get a couple of extra monitors hooked up, regardless of signal quality, refresh rates or… <sighs> schools and offices is what I'm saying. Gaming on the GT710 used to be something of a meme, a cheap way for YouTubers to get cheap laughs out of cheap hardware, though the last 18 months or so of GPU shortages changed that for some people. It's like the scene at the end of the James Bond movie nobody liked, where the evil environmentalist is left in the desert with only motor oil to drink. Eventually, after long enough, even an option you know is bad might start to sound unavoidable. It's not true though. If you need a sub £30 or I guess sub $30 GPU in 2022, there are a couple of less terrible options. As I've said elsewhere, secondhand R7 250s can be picked up on eBay for a similar price. If you have PSU connectors to spare then there's the substantially better R7 260X, and if you can push your budget a little you might be able to stretch to a WX2100 or RX550. On the Nvidia front there's the GTX 650, 750, 750Ti, Quadro K1200 and K2200, all of them available for £50 or less if you hunt around, and if you have an Intel CPU from the 7th gen or later that has integrated HD or UHD graphics, as terrible as they are, they are almost definitely better at gaming than this glorified HDMI port. As I said in the YouTube short that prompted me to make this video, in some cases Nothing is better than the GT710. But okay, say you don't believe me, say you're a DGPU absolutist like this fella, or you absolutely cannot and will not buy better than a GT710. That's okay, I've done my best to dissuade you of this, and if you don't want to believe some random on the internet, I guess I can't blame you for that. The question then is, which GT710 should you buy? Today I'm comparing two different variants of the GT710 both of which have the same GK208B GPU, 1GB of VRAM and old style video outputs, but with one major difference. Bandwidth. One card you've seen before, my passively cooled EVGA model with DDR3 VRAM on a 64-bit memory bus. The second card is new to me, this ASUS model, also passively cooled, features GDDR5 VRAM clocked over 100% higher than the DDR3 but on only a 32-bit bus. On paper, this means the fancier GDDR5 version has 20GB per second of bandwidth, compared to 14.4GB per second on the common DDR3 version. To see how big of an effect this has, I'm going to compare both cards in a handful of low-spec friendly titles using my moderately priced gaming PC featuring a Ryzen 5 5600G and 16GB of RAM. With even a halfway decent graphics card, Valorant can become CPU bound pretty easily. Naturally then, we're nowhere near CPU bound. The DDR3 model starts us off, and at stop clocks and 1080 lowest quality, it manages just 34 FPS on average. The GDDR5 model can't possibly do worse than this, but it does try. Despite the faster memory, the Fancy 710 only manages 38 FPS, or about 10% higher averages. Valorant can feel sluggish even at 60fps, so to anyone looking to enjoy the game, either card offers an experience equivalent to being waterboarded. Last year's testing saw Fortnite's regular renderer fall apart on the DDR3-710, so I skipped testing that and went straight for 1080 performance mode, with low settings and epic view distance. Even so, the pleb version only manages a barely acceptable 30fps on average, with lows dropping into the teens. The fancy model, again, only gains about 10% over the pleb on averages, and lows are virtually static. 
neither one is a good experience, so although I don't usually recommend playing BRs at low resolutions, dropping to 720 would probably be advisable in this case. GTA 5 is notoriously scalable. They could make it work on a PS3, so of course it can run on any modern or semi-modern GPU. The DDR3 710 can at least launch the game, and 22 FPS is technically not unplayable. Here you see me playing the game, though if I were to do this long term I'd probably want to use some resolution scaling, as lowest settings at 1080 is clearly not low enough. The same holds true for the Fancy 710, its faster VRAM only brings an extra 3 FPS on average, a little over 10% above the pleb version. The future of Splitgate is sadly in doubt, as its small development team have announced they're moving on to new things, but servers are still running and it's a good low-end GPU test. Alas, maybe not quite this low. The DDR3-710 requires dropping to half of 1080, with lowest settings just to reach 30fps. The GDDR5 model actually does significantly better, at an average of 48fps, however with scaling at 50%, the game is still hard to play on either card. It's been a while since Valheim left my regular benchmark rotation, and it's still in early access and has probably received some updates in the meantime, so I'm going to pretend last year's GT710 benchmarks are completely invalid. This time around, the DDR3 version managed 12.7 FPS at 720 low, which... Okay, that's a margin of error difference from last year, so clearly not that much has changed. Even though Valheim is a mostly co-op, PvE-focused survival game that doesn't really need high frame rates, this is still a bad time and the fancy model doesn't do a whole lot better. The GDDR5 VRAM allows it to stretch to 17 FPS on average, which is a huge difference as a percentage, but not so huge in practice. Finally, Rocket League can manage a 30 plus frame rate on both versions of the GT710 at 1080 with the lowest presets, with the fancy model doing remarkably better. The pleb version hits 35 FPS on average, while the GDDR5 model almost manages 50 FPS. You'd look at these and probably think they're pretty good numbers, but I'd point you towards the lows. In Rocket League, this can sometimes be put down to goal explosions, but I couldn't help notice both cards experienced big FPS dips as I got closer to the action, which makes actually playing the game pretty hard. So, that all seems conclusive. The fancy GDDR5 model is slightly better than the DDR3 pleb version, though apparently not all the time, and still finds it hard to justify a price tag above, I'd say a tenner, 11.50 tops. Of course, I haven't covered the most exciting part of the GT710 yet, and that's overclocking. GT710s are ideal candidates for overclocks. They don't need much in the way of cooling, and if you do somehow manage to brick your card, Congratulations! You've actually taken one of these bastards out of circulation. You probably deserve a medal. Last year I found my pleb GT710 could turn into a bit of a beast with a 375MHz OC to both core and memory speeds. Ok, by beast I guess I mean something like an angry chihuahua, but I'd still call it an easy no-brainer for anyone trying to game on it. About three quarters of the way through testing this year, I saw my first occurrences of artefacts on the old 710 which suggests that maybe my card has started to degrade, but as the system didn't actually crash or suffer any instabilities, I carried on regardless. If I test this again in the future, I'll probably drop it to 350MHz. Overclocking the fancy 710 didn't yield quite the same big boosts, so I settled on 250MHz core and 350MHz VRAM. This brings the bandwidth of the fancy card up to 22.8GB per second, compared to 20.4GB of the overclocked DDR3. With beast mode engaged, the pleb card sees more than 30% better performance over stock in Valorant, taking average FPS from 34 to 47. The GDDR5 version, interestingly, seems to do a little worse than the DDR3 model. This 1.5 FPS difference is within margin of error and could easily be down to the different map but could also indicate that Valorant values core clocks more than memory bandwidth. Either way, if you happen to purchase your GT710 as part of a PC featuring a reasonably modern i3 or i5, you might want to disable your graphics card for more performance. 
In my test a few months ago, the UHD 730 graphics managed 155 FPS. Yeah. Fortnite was where the overclock proved to be a bit much for the Pleb 710, but on the positive side, this brought 11 more FPS. The resulting 41 FPS is still a good 20% lower than last year's result, though this is just the way optimization works on live service games. The fancy schmancy GDDR5 version, however, does about the same. Like, within a frame difference of the pleb. Neither is quite as good as I'd hoped, though in this case the Intel iGPU didn't fare a whole lot better, and in my opinion, without scaling, all three are unplayable for even a casual player. GTA V, however, becomes extremely playable on either card. Again, there's no discernible difference between DDR3 and GDDR5, but both average over 30 FPS. If you can manage to stay out of the vegetation, you'll probably never even notice the drop in minimums. The Intel iGPU still won handily, averaging 35 FPS and handling 1% lows much better, but the 710s were clearly not as bad as I thought. Like Valorant, Splitgate still feels laggy even at 60 FPS, so overclocking the GT710 is still not enough to get a genuinely enjoyable experience out of the game. Like stock speeds, however, there's still a noticeable benefit to the fancy card over the pleb version, with the latter just breaking past 50 FPS and the former almost reaching 60. The UHD 730's 74 FPS victory is still a pyrrhic one, as you've had to make the game virtually impossible to see properly in order to get there. Likewise, making Valheim playable is a bigger task than overclocking can achieve. There is, again, a bigger difference between DDR3 and GDDR5 than there is in other titles, so Valheim clearly likes to have more memory clocks. Both cards fail to come close to the 36 FPS achieved by the iGPU, however. Rocket League's performance boost from overclocking sadly doesn't completely overcome its issues. There's still a pretty big difference between DDR3 and GDDR5, now down to a 10 FPS lead on the fancy card, but they both drop sharply when you get close to the ball. Not exactly ideal in a game where you um, have to get close to the ball. While the UHD 730 is quite close to the GDDR5 710 on average, the 1% lows on the iGPU are a deal maker for me. It's hard to draw a definitive conclusion whether one GT710 is genuinely worth buying over the other. This was a fairly small cross-section of low-spec games. I didn't cover any demanding modern AAA titles, partly because I think that meme might be dead, but also because I want this video to be at least slightly useful. Still, I accept that there's a chance that some other games will benefit more from the extra memory bandwidth than these games did, though I'm not entirely sure which games they'd be. Only three of the titles tested saw a major benefit from the fancy card over the pleb model, and only in two of those was there a difference between reaching 60 FPS and failing to. There's also the question of the VRAM bus width. According to Tech Power Up, whose model list of GT710s doesn't appear to be quite exhaustive, there is at least one GDDR5 card with a 64-bit bus. I'm not sure, but I strongly suspect the GT710's GPU wouldn't be able to saturate that much bandwidth. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think there's much merit in tracking one down. That being said, if one were to fall into my lap, I guess I'd have to benchmark it. Still, I'm more inclined to recommend gamers on a budget try alternative options. I've linked some videos to other low spec cards I recommend in the description, and there are a couple of my favourites on screen now. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.